This is Amir Killer from Centurion Modern Subject Control. We are fortunate and blessed to have my good friend Nick Faruqi from S2 with us today. Nick is a world-class expert on defensive tactics and next level up with the blade. And uh, we are lucky to have some of his time today. He's going to uh, share a few of the duty knife tactics with you. Uh, but before we get into that, Nick, thanks so much for being with us, sir. Thank you for having me, man. Really appreciate it. Would you uh, give our listeners a little bit of background so they understand why their ears need to perk up and really listen to you right now? What, what is your martial arts background? So uh, while well, my name is Nick Faruqi, I'm the CEO and Director of Training Operations for S2 Strategic Defense. Uh, my company is a training provider for law enforcement, corporate, and civilian groups. Uh, and I'm usually in about 18 states and three to four countries every single year when travel stuff is going on. Uh, I come from a lifetime of martial arts, started like probably a lot of many, many people out there as a youngster and did the traditional martial arts and that kind of stuff. And it was as a teenager, I was introduced to JKD, Jeet Kune Do, which is the Bruce Lee philosophy, and then also Filipino Kali. And if anybody knows anything about Filipino Kali, it is a weapon-based system. Although it's a holistic approach, there's an unarmed aspect to it as well, but everything roots off of the weapons-based stuff. And so, you know, originally I lived in Chicago. I grew up in Chicago. Uh, I live in Texas now, uh, just outside of Dallas. And I, I've owned, I've had the pleasure of owning four martial arts academies over time. And because of the demand in teaching law enforcement, and corporate personnel, that kind of stuff, I ended up closing the academies, moving down here by uh, the Dallas, Texas area, and still continuing teaching, obviously, just more in a seminar format or in a contract-based format. That's awesome. And we are lucky enough to have you with us today at Centurion. Um, what type of trainings have you conducted for law enforcement specifically? I know I've met you and had the pleasure of studying under you at ILEDA, International Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association, which I highly recommend for anybody that's an instructor for defensive tactics or really any other area that's geared towards law enforcement. It's uh, an excellent networking opportunity. You get to meet phenomenal people like Nick and just having that ability to, to, to meet network and pick each other each other's brains is huge um, yeah, it really is what, what else have you done for law enforcement we've uh well i've had a chance to work with uh, a lot of three-letter agencies over time uh, uh federal air marshals uh you know all the federal side of stuff we also work with uh, local municipalities um state uh, specialized teams like rapid deployment guys or uh, swat teams and such and most of the time the, my popularity in the blade is what brings me out. So we teach them the duty knife. We also teach them um, defense against an edge weapons attack. And you might remember that. That was a, a topic that we covered in now. I lead a conference where you and I made friends. And uh, most of the time, it's based off of the knife. We also do a ground control, um, you know, subject control, just, you know, in general, right? Uh, control and restraint, control and escort. Uh, we do force-on-force force instructors based training. So how do you put together a quality force-on-force force program using things like the simulation guns and that kind of stuff? Uh, some of the guys on my staff who come from a law enforcement background say this is something that I personally will not teach, but we can offer as a company is things like uh, room entry or high threat vehicle stop and that kind of stuff. I leave that for them because that is a very specialty thing. You really have to have a lot of time on the job to really have a good understanding of that. Uh, I really honest with who I am and what I do. That's not my specialty, even though I have information on it. Uh, and I feel as a civilian side, I do that fairly well. But uh, uh, for the law enforcement guys, I want somebody from team tactics to teach team tactics, if that makes sense. Absolutely. That's yeah. huge. Now, um, how can our cadets or newer officers find some of your curriculum, get, get a hold of you online for the Defense Against Bladed Attacks? Yeah, so that's a course that we've been teaching. We either teach a regular course, which uh, uh, is typically a, like a one-day course, pretty intense, it gets pretty physical, uh, or we teach the instructor's level courses, which is typically a three-day course uh, for the level one, I should say. And uh, best place to, to get a hold of me for that is just contact me through the website at s2strategic.com or you could contact me through our Facebook page at S2 Strategic Defense uh, on Facebook and uh, contact me through that and we could set up a time to get on the phone and do a quick consultation, you know, and, and talk about the logistics side of things. Every department works a little bit differently. Some people are very closed. They don't want anybody else in. Other uh, places will open up to neighboring jurisdictions. That's cool too. 
Uh, some places have a facility. Some places are looking for help from a different agency who might have a facility. So, you know, let's talk about those things and what kind of numbers we can put together. Uh, and then we'll, we'll put together a good program for your team based off of your requests. Awesome. And we're going to have links right down below the video to S2 Strategic here. Um, obviously, you're, you're very biased towards training and uh, you understand the importance of training because right. you're a phenomenal world-class trainer. Explain, if you would, to our newer cadets, our newer officers, the importance of sticking to their defensive tactics, their physical conditioning, post-academy graduation. It's not just yeah. something to get your certification. Why is that important? If you think it's important, why is that important to do throughout the career? I think it's a 110% important. I mean, you know, nothing breaks my heart more than seeing the uh, patrol officer who's been on for, you know, eight years, 10 years, 20 years, and, you know, he's getting out of his cruiser, and he's got to do the double dip to get out of the car, you know what I mean? And, and like, you know, and he's kind of walking like howdy doody with his butt hanging back and because his back's beat up from sitting in a cruiser for eight years or whatever. Look, here's the thing. You don't have to train for the job, okay? Your, your basic requirements to get in will get you in. It's the bare minimum. What you have to train for is your life, your partner's life, your community's life. If you take that seriously, which a lot of people do because that's why you become an officer, right? You find a calling. And, uh, you know, if you are not taking that responsibility on beyond your academy and beyond uh, the, uh, you know, DT uh, continuing education courses that your agency or neighboring agency might provide, you're failing yourself, you're failing your loved ones, you're failing your family, you're failing your community. And yeah, I get it. You know, we're not going to war. Uh, and hopefully nobody will ever end up in a violent encounter that it's going to come down to the wire. But what if it does? And so what's the old adage, right? You train 99% of the time to be able to apply 1% of the time. So it's kind of one of those types of things. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if you agree with me on this or not, but I have found that the guys that are the most trained or the most competent with their hands seem to have to utilize force a lot less than the untrained officer. The problem with it is, is that with, look, everything is a tool in the toolbox, right? Your unarmed skills are a tool in the toolbox. Your edge weapons are a tool in the toolbox. Your firearms are a tool in the toolbox. Your carbine in the, in the trunk of the car is a tool in the toolbox. Your shotgun in the roof rack is a tool in the toolbox. Your canine is a tool in the toolbox. Now, if you don't, you have to take a look at the job. If you don't understand what the task on hand is, you grab for a tool. If your only tool is the firearm, you're basically a hammer looking for a nail. You know what I mean? They're like you're kind of cause more problems. And so I, I, I agree with you. The, the guys who have, or gals, who have um, good aptitude in a variety of different facets of personal protection, self-defense, uh, defensive tactics in general, they tend to use the least amount of force possible. Whereas somebody who's not as well-versed as them may feel threatened, stress goes up, right? It's that fight or flight, your heart's thumping, you got tunnel vision, and the first thing you do is you draw your pistol and you unload that magazine into, you know, into that subject. And then you realize that this was a bad call. Now you're dealing with the legal ramifications of that aside from the public scrutiny, which is sometimes even worse than the legal ramification. Absolutely, plus yeah. the moral burden and it, it yeah. will change your career, absolutely. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, those untrained officers or the officers that don't apply themselves get bogged down in that fight or flight mechanism that you mentioned, and they never get to the good interview. They never get to the apprehension. They can't move past that with a clear mind because they're so concerned. They understand that they cannot defend themselves if situation arises. Um, so I, I definitely believe the competence, the higher the competence, the better the performance as a police officer. And that's generally speaking. Obviously, there's exceptions. Yeah. There's, also that, there's also the flip side to that, Amir, where – you know, there, and, and, and this is the, the one that really bothers me the most. Because you're wearing a badge, right? That becomes the excuse. I'm a police officer. So what are you talking about? You're talking about ego, right? I'm behind a shield. Yes, you're a point of authority for the people who pay respect to that. As it turns out, by definition, the, the criminal does not care about that. And that's how they became the criminal in the first place. Right. And so, you know, it, it, uh, and the other fact of the matter is that you just don't know. I mean, you could go on a wellness call, right, and show up at somebody's front doorstep, ring the doorbell, and have brass coming through the door. And I know that on a personal level, uh, a friend of mine uh, 
was you know shot in in that particular incident pretty pretty badly actually end up succumbing to some other complications based off of those wounds uh, about a year later and so you know you think it's a wellness call i'm checking on someone right it's not that it's not it's not a robbery it's not uh, an assault it's not you know an active shooter it's a wellness check you know what i mean and that's that's where complacency creeps in complacency creeps in absolutely yeah. well brother would you do me a huge favor and uh, share some of your gems with us? Uh, I certainly will. Uh, well, I don't have any gems, but I'll share some of my knowledge. Uh, before we get into anything kind of physical side of things here, what I want to do is, is show you guys just a quick, some notes on how I explain this to mostly everybody, really, civilian side or not, but law enforcement uh, as well, right, included. And so I put some notes down here for you guys. Normally, I put up a screen share or work this off of a PowerPoint presentation, but I wanted to give you guys something here real quick. And Amir, can you see that okay? Perfect, right there. Perfect. Okay, good. What you're taking a look at here is the three facets of being a complete approach to your training and or capability. In this column right here, you see where it says physical. Your physical capabilities uh, the things that you would work on is something like your cardiovascular, your strength training, your endurance training, and mechanical training. That is the technical side of things, right? That is how to do something. I need this lock. I need this control hold. I need the bar arm takedown, that kind of thing, right? Next to that is what you see is the mental side of things. Awareness, focus, knowledge, and then the ability to process information, right? To be able to do a quick snapshot and respond accordingly to that right and then in the very last column the most fun one is the tactical right stimulus response your actual skill application of that skill and then the last one's really important how to adapt that skill right because violent encounters any encounter is dynamic it changes every second one second it's pretty peaceful. You're trying to cuff somebody. Next second, you have a knife coming at you and you're trying to gain distance to be able to draw that pistol and get on trigger. It changes in a, in a flash, right? And so you have to be able to adapt your skills. It went from hands-on to something totally different and it escalates and de-escalates by the moment. And so complacency creeps in and that's, I think, where a lot of people get in trouble. Um, this is not a linear thing. It's a cycle. You should be working all three at all points in time. And as you do it, one of the things that you realize is the more I train on the physical level, my mental acuity gets better. And as my mental acuity gets better, I learn how to adapt and my tactical skill gets better. So it constantly goes around, right? The more I start working on my tactical side, that's making me think. And then, so that's improving my mental acuity. And as I'm doing that, now I have to kind of, you know, work my physical side back into this too, because I have to actually perform uh, a response to a particular stimulus. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, does that make sense to you, brother? Absolutely. Yeah, so that's how, kind of how I break things down. And so, you know, if you were going to come up with your workout program, right, whether you're talking martial arts, whether you're talking defensive tactics in the law enforcement community, you should look at this straight across the board as a holistic approach and see how much stock, how much time you're putting in to each one of those columns. If you're putting a lot of stock into the tactical aspect, but you're putting no stock into the physical cardio and strength and endurance, then you're like, you're going to be a very tired trigger man. Make sense. And so, you know, we have to keep that in mind and be realistic with how we approach this thing. And by the way, nothing's going to take you out of a fight faster than those physical attributes like cardiovascular capabilities, right? Teague makes cowards out of all of us. That's, you know, the air, right? Oh, so we're pumped. And so, you know, I want people to understand that this is the way you should approach your training. And, and it doesn't have to be all in the same, like every workout has to have all three. I'm saying, make sure you take time and focus on this. And so one of the things that we find in the law enforcement community in specific is that because officers are uh, depending on their agencies to bring somebody in, right? A subject matter expert, an instructor in something. We'll just wait for that. And hopefully we can get on, you know, on the roster for that based on the budget that we have. And so they don't want to come out of pocket for their own expenses or any of that stuff. And I'm telling you, that's going to fail you. One, I, I want to 
encourage every agency to continually expand your DT exposure. The reason why I say that is because violent encounters are escalating and we're still using the training from 1992, okay? It doesn't make sense. You're creating a deficiency, okay? And so uh, I would encourage the agencies to continually encourage more and more training. And I would encourage every officer to take that responsibility because the job is responsible for you when you're on the job. They're not responsible for you when you're on your way home or you're out with your family, any of those types of things. Or, you know, like one of the big topics right now is off-duty response to active shooter. That means you were in the grocery store and there's a gunman across the street. You, you got wind of it somehow and you are now going shield up and, 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 and you know, work in the scene. You don't know. And so don't fail yourself that way. You're setting yourself up by, uh, by cheating that particular time in training, right? And there's also going to be things that you like and what you don't like. I love edged weapons. That's why it became a thing for me. I hated being on the ground, but I forced myself to spend time in jujitsu, not because I want to be a jujitsu black belt, which I'm not, by the way, but because I wanted to... Uh, I identified a vulnerability and I wanted to make a solution for that. And jujitsu allowed me to do that because the biggest problem in jujitsu for people who don't know jujitsu is you don't know how to navigate the ground, positional dominance, right? And so when you, when you, when your back gets against the asphalt and you have a 200 pound, you know, pissed off someone who's raining hell down on, on you and you don't know how to respond to it because you don't know how to navigate the ground. I don't need to be able to do a, a barambolo sweep, you know, flying arm bars or any of those kinds of stuff. I need to be competent on the ground. And so we focus in those uh, isolated aspects just as much as we do as bringing it together. And so let's just say that if you trained with the knife for a year and then you jumped into a jiu-jitsu program, Amir teaches a great jiu-jitsu program. I'm actually looking forward to the next time I see him so I can do some private training with him. And so the, you, know, you, you, lay, you learned one, you learned the other. Can we combine those things? How are you going to grapple against the knife? Or how are you going to grapple your way to your pistol, right? And so, and we've seen body cam footage, dash cam footage, surveillance video, cell phone video of officers who are down on the ground and they're fish out of water, literally fish out of water, right? And the, and the aggressor is com taking complete advantage of them on sheer aggression, not even on skill. We've seen it over and over. I, and, and I don't know about you guys. I call that a clue, okay? And so... Uh, I want you to keep that in mind. And so here, you know, one of the things that, uh, that Amir and I spoke with before this thing got started was that, Nick, right now we're in this COVID-19 thing. I'm dealing with cadets. They're not necessarily back in the academy. How do I train at home individually? And I will tell you something that I'll show you guys some stuff that you can start off working on, okay? First thing I'll tell you is this. Learning happens on my time. Training happens on your time. You come to me as an instructor. You come to me and say, hey, Nick, we are trying to learn something. Can you teach us this thing? And I will teach you that thing and then how to train that thing. By the next time you see me, you need to be training that thing. And that's how you progress. It's not come to class. It's not get on the mats once a month. It's I'm going to learn some stuff. I'm going to take quality notes. I'm going to try to video some stuff and I'm going to go home and I'm going to work that thing until I'm ready to move into the next level. Okay. And so training, uh, learning happens on my time. Training happens on your time. All right. One of the things that we talk about in training, especially solo is training gear is important. And so me going to present to you guys some basic edged weapon stuff. I will tell you, do not train with a live blade, okay? I'm using a training blade. They make plastic ones. They make rubber ones. If you don't have a training blade, buy one. They're cheap enough. They're like 10 bucks to 20 bucks. Um, you can buy uh, the, the uh, soft foam sparring knives if you have, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. I think, Amir, I think I showed you my, my sparring knives last year at Ailita, right? You did. Yeah, and so that's good for contact stuff. I can't tell you how many people that I've seen who've been like, oh, I'll just use a training or, or a live blade and end up slicing themselves wide open, deep, okay? And now they're stitches, maybe they're off of work, you know, that kind of stuff, they're missing other things. Don't put yourself in that, you know, look, you're not gonna dry fire with a live gun. So why are you going to dry fire train your knife with a live knife, okay? 
seen some terrible things happen. People have stabbed themselves. They've lost it, dropped it into their, into their quad. You know, pointy end goes in. Now you're, you know, risking the femoral and all kinds. I mean, there's just, you know, find good tra quality training gear. It's usually inexpensive. It is certainly a lot less expensive than hospital bills and insurance costs, okay? And so we'll go from there. Okay, so how do we train at home? And, and really, I kind of have a long progression uh, in this thing, but I'll share some stuff with you guys here just to get you started. And by the way, I'm going to aim this at the cadet, the newbie. I'm not aiming this at somebody who's well versed with the knife, okay? Because foundations are important. Uh, I'll, before we get into this, I'll point this out too. Fundamentals are not fundamentals because they're beginner level. Fundamentals are fundamentals because they are incremental. They're, everything is based off of that. So whether you're a beginner practitioner or you're an advanced practitioner, the difference is the advanced practitioner can apply those fundamentals better and without conscious effort, where a beginner is still learning that. So you don't be like, oh, that's a fundamental. Yeah, it's a fundamental because it applies everywhere. It's not fundamental because it's easy, okay? So let's get into some fundamentals, okay, real quick. And uh, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to step back here, but I'll make sure that uh, I'm still in view. So I don't have to stab the camera and I'm going to take just a moment and move the camera up so that way you guys can see me a little bit better. Okay. How are we doing over there? Perfect. Good. Okay. And you can still hear me okay, right? Absolutely. Okay. So guys, uh, first thing I'm going to show you guys, and you can apply this to the duty knife as well, uh, is your basic five angles. Okay. How do you move the knife? This is your, this is your ABCs of knife work. Okay. Basic five angles is and if I'm holding the knife right-handed, from my right side shoulder to my left side hip is an angle one. So this kind of a slashing method. Then we have the angle two, which is left shoulder to right hip. Okay, so we have a one and an angle two. So just when we put those together, we call that an Ekkies pattern or an X pattern. So just think about like an X. One and two, okay? Then you have the angle three and four, which is a lateral cut. Kind of think like a abdomen level, right? Stomach level, across the belly and across the belly, okay? Angle three is right to left, angle four is left to right. And an angle five is any kind of a thrust in, okay? Now, systematically, I teach a 12 angle method. I've been involved with different Filipino martial arts that are like 144 me uh, angle method, okay? Don't concern yourself with that. All that is is a nomenclature so you and I can, um, I can say, hey, Amir, give me an angle three and you know that it's an angle three, okay? Don't worry about the numerical system and don't overcomplicate this. Angle one, angle two, angle three, angle four, angle five. And those are the things that we could do in gross motor movement. It's not really technical work for working that blade, right? It's simple stuff. Angle one, angle two, angle three, angle four, angle five. Okay. So one of the things that we first start off by doing is exactly what I just did. I count that five angles through and through. So I go one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And so I want you guys to pay attention to something because this is the next part of this. I don't chop it's sharp, so it doesn't require power. It requires speed in application, okay? So you don't see me go one, two, three, four, five, okay? You don't see me making these herky-jerky, full power kind of a motion. What you see is fluidity in that movement, one, two, three, four, five. And every single one, leads into the next, right? My angle one hits that natural break, goes into angle two, hits the natural break, goes into the three. So they all kind of tie in together. And so we want that fluidity, okay? So that's the first thing we should focus on is getting through those five angles. And then you go over to the left side or your uh, support hand, one, two, three, four, five, and you work it on both sides because we want to have symmetrical skill. Now you're gonna find that one side does not look as pretty as the other, that's okay, all right? and you're training at home. Go slow, take your time, that's the whole point. So if you have those five basic angles, first we go through all those 
ensuring, and do this in front of a mirror or a camera. I prefer camera so I can replay it. And I want to have the proper mechanical structure. Let's talk about structure briefly. Uh, let me give you an example. Amir, I have my cert pistol here. This is not a live gun. It does not have an operating slide. It does have a magazine, but it does not take any ammunition in that magazine. And it shoots a laser pointer, okay? I want you guys to picture this. Imagine having a subject or some violent encounter having in front of you, and you draw your pistol, and you go, stop or I'll shoot. Is that pistol helping me? No, it's not because it's not in a fight. It is not in that real estate between me and the threat. So if that person decides to bull charge me or tackle me or any of that stuff, this fight, this gun never got in the fight, right? We put that in the middle between us, right? So we work, we move our angles, and we work that gun as such, correct? That same rule applies to a knife. I don't take the knife and, and go, oh my God, stop or else I'm going to slice you. Right? We put the knife in between us. Why do we really do that? We do that because A, availability, right? So he's between, it's between me and that. The other reason is I want you guys to focus on me and as, act as if I'm right in front of you. Are you more inclined to tackle and encroach my space if I'm like this, like this, like this, like this, or this? Why don't you want to come when the knife is between us? So I always want to force that guy to have to come through my weapon, whether it's my firearm, whether it's my knife, whether it's my uh, uh, unarmed skills, whether it's my baton and asp, whether it's my pepper spray, whether it's my taser, whether it's a shoe, whether it's a two by four, I want to make them come through the tip of the knife. That means I've owned this real estate. You know the old adage, remember how we kind of used to say this, Samir? Ain't nothing between us except for air. Okay, well, there's air in the tip of a knife. So get froggy, fool, right? <laughs> okay. So when we talk about the structure, you know, when you're doing these ones, twos, threes, four, fives, what do you notice? I'm not pulling my elbow away from my body. I'm not swinging hard, okay? Everything happens. So one way to train this is literally grab your own elbow or bicep, pin it to your body, and force your hips to move, okay? Yeah, and so you learn how to keep this in tight. So imagine this, this is what we call inside the box. Imagine a box, or if you're like me, you'll take some of that blue painter's tape. You'll tape a rectangle on the wall. So uh, about nose height, about shoulder width or so apart, down just past the waistline or groin area, and then close that box off. So we have this box. I move that blade inside of that box. Okay, that box is representative of the space between me and the threat. Okay, so first, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, right side, left side. Then focus on just making sure you have fluidity and you're not choppy through it. Then you put in this inside the box drill. Okay, to keep, to learn how to keep this structure correct. And then the last part that you want to do to this is what we call the metronome drill. Metronome drill, if you guys understand a metronome, it, uh, musicians use it all the time, right? Tick tock, tick tock. It measures time, rhythm, right? Tick tock. Now, what we want to do is develop um, not that necessarily a rhythm. I'm not moving, I'm not racing the tick and the tock. What's important is what I'm doing between the tick and the tock. I'll give you an example of this. We just talked about this. If I'm going tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock tick tock tick tock tick tock okay that's still bad isn't it but i'm on rhythm i hit it every single time i hit the tick that's incorrect what you want to do is in between those beats and so we go tick tock tick tock tick tock tick tock tick tock okay and so we want to maintain that um control of the pace Agreed? And the reason why you do that is weapons familiarity, okay? The more familiar you are with, the, with your weapon, whether it's this, a firearm, a machete, you know, whatever, 
the more familiar you are with it, the more control you're going to have with it. The more control you are going to have of it, the better you're going to be able to utilize it. Okay. And so, you know, for our cadets, when you come out and start getting into the firearms portion of your training, you don't go on the range and start jumping in and out of cars and, you know, doing SWAT rolls and Honda rolls over the hood and, you know, hiding behind barricades. You learn, this is the grip. <laughs> this is the trigger guard. This is the trigger. This is the slide. This is the safety. This is your, you know what I mean? And so you piece by piece. Why? Because that needs to be completely without conscious effort. You never want to learn something in the middle of a fight. You want to always want to learn it before the time comes. And so, you know, you need this to, to you can't be stuck in the middle of, uh, what did that Nick guy say on that, on that podcast or on that video with Amir? You can't go about it that way. It's got to be without conscious effort. The best way to do it is go back to the fundamentals and repeat over and over and over and over and over until you turn blue in the face, grab some water, come back and do it again. And then the last thing that I'll add for your training progression here is this. So we started off with basic five, right? Then we put in um, right side, left side and making sure that we have control. Then we put in the inside the box drill and then we put in the metronome drill. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to bring some other dynamic movement into all of that. Okay, so work the knife, work the rear hand, work the knife, learn how to switch, get your pistol, okay, get, put that pistol down, work the knife, move around, just have nothing but footwork, okay, and so when you do that, you start making this more and more, more dynamic. One thing that I can promise every single person is this, I've taught this to whether you're talking special operations guys, law enforcement guys, or just the brand spanking mom that comes in for a women's self-defense class. And what you realize is that if, you, if they actually listen to you and they do this for five to 10 minutes a day over the course of seven days, they look 180 degrees different, okay? Movement never lies. People lie. Movement never lies. And so, you know, I watch somebody's footwork. I watch somebody's mechanics. I watch their structure. I watch how they control that knife and how familiar they are with it. Instantly, I know if they've spent time in training and developing or if they're just, you know, blowing smoke. Does that, does that work for you? That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Um, just want to reiterate and clarify, if you yeah. noticed uh, that Nick did not teach you when to deploy this knife, he taught you how. And that's very, very intentional because there are a lot of legal ramifications and uh, legal standards that you have to meet depending on your state, your agency, et cetera. This is definitely a deadly force situation uh, where the officer believes uh, reasonably believes that he or she is about to be killed or receive great bodily harm. So we are not at all touching the when to deploy, but he's sp simply teaching you how to deploy. And yeah, right now, I, don't, I never assume policy for one, right? I, I always let you guys decide. My job is not to rewrite policy for you. Plus, you know, hey, look, Amir, you know, even at ILEDA, you've seen our classes, right? We have anywhere from 50 to hundred people in every single class. That's a hundred different agencies, potentially their policies may be different. And so I am not here to tell you that part of it. You should have the aptitude and the training. And if you have questions, talk to some of your, maybe your senior command and say, Hey, what about this? What about that? What I'll tell you is this, we've seen several times in this past nine months, at least three or four officers have had to move to their backup knife either because their firearm failed, their firearm got taken, their firearm fell out of their holster because they didn't put the thumb bill on, and so things like that, or they're grappling on the ground and they can't get their hand to their pistol, but they can get their hand to their blade, okay? And so uh, as a concept, I want you to think about it like that. I'm not going to tell you when and when not to do something. I'm only going to tell you that, hey, we know that these potentials have actual, uh, actualized, and so that might give you some idea on when and when not to. It's huge. And uh, also for some of the critics that are uh, not big fans of blades, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Well, what if you can't bring your gun into the fight? What if you're being disarmed at the moment and that's all you have? Wow. So those are things to consider as far as how you set up and how you carry your duty knife, whether if you're going to carry it on your support side so your dominant hand could 
fend off the attacker, or if you want to carry it for a better deployment with the right or your dominant side, those are all things that you need to think about and consider here in the safety and environment of your home, like Nick said, not when the fight is initiated. And, and by policy too, right? I mean, exactly. I, I, got, I got agencies that allow fixed blades and I got ones that do not allow fixed blades. I got agencies that allow you to put it on your, on your vest. I got agencies that do not allow it on the vest. I got some that say in the belt. I got some that say in the pocket. So what do you want me to tell people? Uh, the okay. only thing I can tell you is you need to take a look at your policy and do that. I'm not here to debate policy, whether I like it, dislike it, agree with it, disagree. I don't care. I care that, you know, I, I teach how you to be better with the blade. Perfect. You know I mean? You've Absolutely. made the decision to get to the blade. That's when my role starts. That's it. Once you figure out what your policy is, you need to practice that way. If you were, right. uh, if you are to carry a fixed blade on your support side by policy, Right. It makes no sense for you to practice off of the right side or your dominant side. Make sure you're practicing exactly how you're going to carry. Fight right. like you train, train like you fight. That's right, 100% correct. And, you know, it, uh, uh, it's a great tool in the toolbox as long as you have command over that tool. And, um, you know, I mean, the, the, you have multiple layers in your arsenal, right? I mean, hands-on skill. Um, uh, tasers, OC spray, firearm. This is just a great addition to it. Although I will tell you that it's typically on the, to me, when I look at the blades, it's just as lethal as a firearm and the, and the use of force model. And so, and I think pretty much everybody's agreed on that. So you have to keep in mind. So are you do, being redundant with that or are you just giving yourself a backup tool, which is why we say back up duty knife. You never say it's your duty knife. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah. Well, brother, we are so fortunate to have you. Uh, I hope the cadets understand uh, the privilege they're having, and I hope they yeah. take this to heart. And um, I look forward to working with you and seeing you in August. Yes. Thank you for having me, for your cadets, and uh, anybody watching this, be safe, be well, uh, and train hard, and hopefully some of this helps you out. And by all means, if you ever need to contact me, please do. Uh, and if you can't get a hold of me, get a hold of Amir, and he knows how to get a hold of me directly anyways. Uh, I'm, I'm here to serve you. Awesome. Thank you, brother. You guys stay safe out there and thank you for watching.